Hey everybody, I appreciate y'all using the chat box. Um, when you are using the chat box, in the two section, it says panelists. Um, it, it, I think it defaults to that, but make sure it's going to panelists and attendees um, so everybody can, can kind of see your questions whenever they come through. Um, also, people might want to see where you're from. So we've got people from Simpsonville joining us, Columbia. Uh, let's see, Greenville. That's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I, you know, geology uh, affects the entire state, right? <laughs> Clemson, I love this. All right, and uh, you know, my name is Jay Keck. I'm the Habitat Education Manager. I'll pop on the video here too, um, with South Carolina Wildlife Federation. Um, but I'm usually, you know, always talking about birds and I love my, I love my pretty songbirds, but I also like my, uh, like my gems and minerals. My dad used to be a, a part of the Columbia Gem and Mineral um, Society, or I guess it was a South Carolina and he used to take me uh, all over the state looking for things. And um, I remember finding garnet with them and uh, smoky quartz was one of my favorites, but amethyst, I guess, uh, purple is my favorite color. Uh, is, is probably my, my go-to. Purple and green is, is an amazing combination, but uh, I don't know. I usually ask what, what your favorite birds are, but y'all tell me what your favorite, um, what your favorite uh, rocks are, I guess, or even, you know, geological formations around the state. I'd like to know. Got one amethyst. I hear you, Tina. It's a good one. Limestone bluffs. Somebody's excited about some limestone bluffs. I'm sure Montgomery, our uh, our geology expert today and board member, is uh, she probably shares that same excitement. I don't know what happens on limestone bluffs, but you know, <laughs> it could be. It could be. Limestone is a very cool rock, Jay. I will say that. <laughs> I don't, I mean, is it as cool as amethyst though? <laughs> I don't know. I, you know what, to each their own. That's right. Um, for me, my favorite rock is actually, um, well, it's actually mineral, but um, my favorite mineral is muscovite. I love muscovite. I love finding big sheets of it um, up here in the upstate. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. I don't know what that looks like, but I'm sure I've seen it before, I guess. Oh, yeah. Know? And, and we have Gail saying that sparkly mica in the rocks gets her excited. And you know, Absolutely. That, that, that makes me think of a, uh, a time where I lost this wedding ring right here uh, <laughs> in, in the Congaree River. And the next day I went to Dick Sporting Goods and bought a you know, pair of goggles and found my wedding ring uh, in the river sitting on a big boulder, um, kind of like a spider lily, which we'll talk about oh uh, in a little bit, you know, would do. But I remember, you know, the first time I dove down to look for the ring, I saw a bunch of mica and I was like, oh my gosh, am I gonna find gold down here? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely beautiful. It was like a bunch of stars just sitting in the river. Yeah, really cool. yeah, you know. If you were near the Kershaw area, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it couldn't happen, but um, gold. we do have, there is a gold mine um, out in Kershaw. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but um, it reopened actually within the past couple of years. Um, so Very cool. it's a, it's interesting. We see gold at a hydrothermally altered areas. Um, if y'all are familiar with that, we won't dive too much into that today, but if you want to learn more about um um, some of those types of minerals, uh, let me know. Uh, yeah, no, that sounds awesome. And you said a word that I've never heard before. So um, <laughs> I, I wonder if everybody looks as, you know, bewildered as I do, but uh, <laughs> look, somebody likes chert. Uh, oh, so chert. CRT. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Primarily yeah. due to its archaeological significance in South Carolina. That's very interesting. Yeah. Chert is a very, very cool, uh, Cool type of rock for sure. Um, yeah, and we'll give it. We'll give it probably like it's twelve o'clock right on the nose right now. But okay, we'll maybe like two more minutes for people to to kind of sign sign awesome. on, on in. Yeah, that's very cool. 
30 acre rock. I would imagine as a geologist, hey, you, you've gone there, right? Or I have actually never been to 30 acre okay. rock. I need to make a trip. There are a lot of places in South Carolina that I have not been to yet. Um, yeah. I'm like, amazingly, even having lived here my whole life, but um, I have not made the trip there. No, I, I get that. People are like, oh, so have you birded here? Have you gone to look at birds there? <laughs> and I, I, I say probably no, you know, more than than yes, because I've got two kids, a wife, a job, and it's just, you know, kind of hard to like see all these <laughs> awesome places. There's so many, I mean, our, our state has so many different um, geologic formations and so varied um, formations across across the entire state that it's it's pretty near impossible to see them all. But um, I would love to know if, uh, if any of you have. <laughs> so I see paint, paint rocks near Camden. So cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, so, so everybody, um, if you remember just to, whenever you type into the chat box, um, just to make sure it's going to all pan or panelists and attendees. So if you ask a question, people can see it. If it's just going to panelists, you know, just a few people are going to be able to see it. So just make sure the two section you click on <clears throat> panelists and attendees. Yeah. Um, you won't be able to speak. Um, so that's the way you, you kind of communicate. Montgomery is going to be, um, you know, leading the, the webinar, um, providing all sorts of cool information about geology and some wildlife. And y'all can still ask questions during the webinar. I'll take a peek at the chat box from time to time and I can interrupt her. She's given me permission to interrupt her. Um, yes, during, he has yeah. permission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so don't think I'm being rude. Uh, to interrupt and, and ask uh, the questions. So um, yes. please do that. Um, she loves them. She's, she's, uh, she's got the answers for y'all. So um, uh, we'll, we'll get started here in just a second. Um, while we're just kind of waiting one more minute, y'all don't forget about our auction that's coming up on July 15th for South Carolina Wildlife Federation. Um, it runs a, a few days to the 18th. Uh, we've got some really cool uh, items, um, some more that are gonna be you know, popping on. You can just go to our website, go to the events uh, tab um, and you'll find the auction and you just register there. And uh, who knows, you might, you know, my brother and I are gonna do a forks, knives and spoon bills, a, pr a private dinner. So he's a chef down in Charleston. So he's gonna be cooking, I'm gonna be helping. And then I'm gonna talk about the, the dishes or the, the, the animals that those dishes represent. So we're gonna kind of do a private forks, knives and spoon bill. So that's just one of the, the many, many, many items that we're gonna have on the list. Uh, so don't forget about it, sign up please and support us so we can do more free things like this and uh, spread the love of not just wildlife, but you know, science, geology, you know, it's really- Yeah, to be able that to is a that. fabulous dinner. If you have not participated in this dinner, I fully encourage you to go. There are some really interesting and creative dishes um, that have been made, you know, with the different restaurants that have participated. So please, please join. Yeah, and we do have one, you know, at a restaurant. Well, it's it's a to go, you know, with sensitivity towards COVID still. Mm -hmm. um, this this in July coming up. Uh, yeah, that's a rail. So yeah, um, let's see. And it, and it's our 90th anniversary. Uh, so we're turning 90 this year. We're having a uh, a big party in October. So y'all, you know, be on the lookout for those emails and, and notifications. But y'all come join and celebrate nature with us and celebrate conservation and uh, meet some people that that love nature just like you do. Um, all right, let's see. Can you share your screen yet, Montgomery? Let's see. Yes, I believe I can. I'm gonna pull this up and just like uh, we have been saying for a year and a half at this point, can everyone see my screen? <laughs> it's coming, there we go. Yes. Okay, y'all can see the, the first slide, South Carolina Geology and Wildlife Habitat. Yes. Okay, awesome. Very good. All, All right, right everybody. Let it rip. Awesome. Well, my name is Montgomery Spillane, um, former, formerly Montgomery Taylor. Um, I grew up actually in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm one of four girls, um, much to the chagrin of my parents. Um, we all are pretty, um, pretty big hunters, um, pretty big outdoor, um, outdoor outdoors women. And um, we, we spent most of our childhood actually just, you know, kind of running around the Sandhills area, um, which kind of leads me to how I got into this profession. So 
I got to CFC, College of Charleston, um, for you guys who may, you know, not be as familiar with the state, but um, I got there and I was studying pre-med actually. And um, I had a friend who looked at me one day, his, his um, parents were in medicine and he said to me, do you, I mean, you like love being outside. This doesn't make sense. Like, why would you want to do this for the rest of your life? So, um, you know, I thought about that some and I loved biology. I thought that the applications of biology were really, really cool. And I wanted to continue studying science. And so that led me to wanting to study meteorology. So long story short, um, I was paired with an advisor who was actually a geology professor at College of Charleston. And um, anyway, we started talking about what I would need to do in order to become a meteorologist. And she told me that I would have to study physics of all things and major in physics and maybe do a little bit of oceanography. And that sounded like my worst nightmare. <laughs> so um, anyway, I actually studied marine geology because she set me up um, on going on a, uh, an expedition offshore to, to map seafloor, which was so, so cool. Um, it was an amazing opportunity and it got me some awesome exposure um, to, um, you know, continental shelf slope habitat, um, which is you know, that also falls under the realm of geology um, in our state as well. And we'll discuss more of that later. Um, but I actually studied bathymetry um, mostly in, in my undergrad. So basically bathymetry is like topography underwater. You can think of it that way. Um, a lot of my friends actually have continued on and they have careers doing that. Um, I am actually an environmental consultant in, in the Southeast. I work for a company called SES Engineers. Um, and I am a professional geologist currently in South Carolina and North Carolina and getting my reciprocity in Florida, which sometimes can take a long time. So I'm waiting on that currently, but um, it has been such a wonderful profession. I started out being in the field a lot um, when I first started and um, I met my husband um, doing this as well. Um, we are both geologists and um, we're actually both well drillers. We got our well drilling certification in South Carolina. So we have, um, we've gotten the opportunity to do a lot of drilling um, all over the state and get to see, um, see all the lithology and uh, the sediment and rock types on a very, uh, very personal level <laughs> for years. So um, I've been a board member with uh, South Carolina Wildlife Federation since early 2020. And this has been a absolutely wonderful organization to be a part of. I had seen, you know, all of the different programs that they put on and events, um, but being a part of the board has showed me so much about, honestly, how little I knew about South Carolina habitat and, um, you know, our role as, um, you know, conservationists um, and, and why education is so important in all of that as well. So, um, you know, I, one of my biggest um, goals in life is to have people get curious about something that may sound as dull as geology, but is actually absolutely fascinating and can be so beautiful. Um, you know, honestly, we'll, we'll discuss this a lot. I get really enthusiastic about geology, if y'all can't tell, but <laughs> um, there are aspects of geology that I think are just gorgeous. So I actually, um, I actually create artwork um, using what are called thin sections of rock or actually just using a dissecting microscope and looking at um, sediment grains. So this little clip that you see here um, is actually that textile that's used um, in this painting is sand from Folly Beach of all places <laughs> under a microscope that's been mirrored and then screen printed onto fabric and then used in painting. So I want to make, I want to make geology a conversation. Um, I want people to be interested in it. I want to show others that it can be an, an artistic um, thing as well as being a hard science. Um, so, you know, being interested in geology, we love to hike. Um, I mentioned earlier, we grew up, I grew up hunting with my family kind of um, like all over the Midlands area. And, um, I, you know, I'm learning stuff every single day. Um, that all being said, I have been in the industry for about six years now, um, and I am working as an environmental consultant. So um, 
I see different aspects of geology um, than maybe what I'm specifically talking about, but the applications are, are there for anybody, anybody who's interested in science. Um, you know, if you ever have any question, I'll have my like my uh, email at the end of this presentation. Um, but if you want to know more about how how habitat and geology are are very linked, let me know. Um, just to show like just to show um, as far as like this other picture of, of me hiking here. Um, so that was actually taken not in South Carolina. It was taken at a. Uh, at uh, Mount Mitchell, we went on a beautiful hike up there. I would encourage you guys to visit um, that area if possible, <clears throat> excuse me, and hike around and see what beautiful rocks you can see, so. Um, hey, Montgomery, we yeah. have a question and we're not okay. the first slide. Uh, All right. Do you drill for oil in South Carolina? What are you drilling for? Oh, <laughs> that is a great question, so. Um, we actually drill pretty shallow. Um, we we're drilling inland and we actually look for contaminants stemming from um, different industrial processes. So um, we'll put in monitoring wells, um, kind of all, it depends on the type of assessment that we're doing, but um, we'll put in monitoring wells of various steps. Um, we'll take look a look at lithology or like the, the actual um, like, stratigraphy of an area and see where we should be putting these wells in based on availability of water. Um, and then we'll assess and see how contamination moves. Um, I'll discuss that a little bit more later, um, but it's it's very important to know, um, you know, how, how groundwater and um, certain types of um, sediments, you know, work together to either allow or disallow um, contamination or impacts to move. So, um, it, no oil. <laughs> but if we find oil, it's not a good thing. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so why should we learn about this? I kind of touched on it earlier, um, but there's a lot of interconnection between biodiversity and habitat here. Um, so a lot of you might might know this. I know that there are a few geologists that are actually tuning in, um, and we all we all kind of like inherently know it. Um, we know like generally some of the physiographic regions. Um, so like it, it's a it's a pretty amazing thing that we can apply um, this particular science, and then we can kind of know what kind of animals or um, flora that we're going to see in an area based on that. Um, so this geology helps us describe how certain landscapes came to be. So we have these mountain building events that are called orogenies. You'll hear me use that term um, quite a bit later. Um, and then island formation. Um, how, how do we get these barrier islands on the coast? Um, you know, why is our geomorphology the way it is? Um, and how can these processes be described? Um, so I touched on this with the oil earlier, but this also helps um, me as a, as a scientist figure out how contamination could move through certain media, like either soil, groundwater, or air, and how this could impact ecosystems. Um, you know, if we see something that could potentially prevent, um, you know, any sort of like impact from contamination, or if there's some sort of engineering control that we could place, it's, it's really, really crucial for us to know um, what we can do in order to help, you know, keep South Carolina beautiful. Um, so that is, that's just, you know, to me, why South Carolina geology is really important. Some of you might already be super interested in it. So that's, you know, that's super awesome too. So um, I, I could probably think of a thousand other different ways why, um, why it's great, but we'll, we'll dive into this more and hopefully I can convince you if you're not convinced. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're going to do a geology crash course. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have seen Shrek, but this is one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> I like that boulder. That's a nice boulder. Um, I totally relate to Doggy on this one. Totally a geology nerd. Um, my husband and I, when we go on hikes, you know, we'll get into debates over, you know, what we would consider this rock type to be. Um, it's super fun. So geology is defined as the science that deals with Earth's physical structure and substance, history, and the processes that act on it. 
wow, that's pretty loaded, right? Like that's, that's a lot in one, you know, type of science. Um, it combines a lot of other different types of science too. I know like sometimes people make fun of geologists um, for being, uh, you know, rocks for jocks or rock hounds, but it also combines a lot of biology, a lot of chemistry, a lot of physics, unfortunately, but it's, it's super interesting to see how all of these can combine to actually make rock. Um, or sediments. Um, that also includes sediments. It's not all rocks. It also includes sediments and uh, some of these broader things um, like geomorphology. So um, anyway, so there are big aspects of geology like geomorphology. Um, we have plate tectonics, uh, you know, these mountain building events, um, the creation of barrier islands. And then we have these super small aspects of geology like what I was mentioning earlier with these textiles that I've been making. Um, so we have, we look at little slivers of rock under a microscope, and then we can figure out what the mineral assemblage is for a rock. Um, we look at uh, little tests of micro fossils, um, like forams under a microscope, or we can do like analysis on them and figure out like how old they are. And that helps us figure out, um, you know, climate like historic climate. So there are a lot of applications to geology. It's very, very hard. I think a lot a lot of times that um, people aren't sure like what they wanna study with it because, uh, because there's such broad swaths of things you could. So, okay, pop quiz. Hope everybody's ready. What is the South Carolina State Rock? You can put your, your um, answers in the chat box and, uh, and Jay will let me know. And they are coming nice. fast. Wow, guys, you all doing great. <laughs> yeah, awesome. so, I am so impressed. Are all of you geologists? Because, <laughs> I mean, I, man. <laughs> probably created a Carolina fence garden where they actually install, <laughs> yeah. install and nobody got it wrong. Everybody got it right. See? I'm so impressed, you guys. Y'all get an A+. Plus. <laughs> a+, plus, everybody. Okay. So if you said C, Blue granite, you're correct. All right, so this is a hand specimen. This is not blue granite. It's got a little bit too much orth, like this pink orthoclase to really be what I would consider a blue granite, but it is a granite. So it kind of shows you some of the mineral assemblage, um, like what we would see in, a, in blue granite. Um, so a little bit about blue granite, unique to the Midlands and Piedmont region of the state. Um, this is where it's found in abundance. Um, so there was a bill that was passed in 1969 and the legislators, legislatures declared that it had been used to beautify so many areas of South Carolina that it was the perfect choice for a South Carolina state rock, which is pretty cool. Um, so yes, it's also known as the Winsboro Blue Granite or sometimes people call it Winsboro Blue. And it's usually about, it's kind of light blue or gray. Um, you can kind of see that when you're like zoomed out, you can see that it's a little bit uh, a little bit more blue than pink. Um, if you guys are familiar with Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina, they actually have a beautiful trail called the Pink Beds Trail, and that's attributed to orthoclase um, in rock. My husband and I looked that up not too long ago because we were thinking it was like flower beds or something, right? But no, um, you actually see uh, you see orthoclase um, in certain rocks, and um, yeah, that's that's actually what that trail is named after. If if you ever um, head up that way, so anyway, a little bit more about granite. Granite is an igneous rock, meaning that it was formed when magma or molten rock, like under Earth's surface, if it's exposed to Earth's surface, it's considered lava. Um, under Earth's surface was trapped beneath the Earth. Um, it intermingled um, with other particles. And it was allowed a lot of time to cool. So you, you see a lot more um, crystals or larger crystals in a granite than you might normally see in something that wasn't allowed that amount of time to cool. So um, pretty, pretty awesome stuff. Um, this is just kind of a fun fact. Uh, in 1909, uh, Public Works of Charleston reported that more than 28,000 linear feet of granite curb were placed along its streets. If you've spent any time in Charleston, it's pretty cool to see um, that, that this stone is actually used down there. And uh, granite obviously is used for a ton of different, a ton of different construction purposes. And um, I mean, I, I like granite 
countertops. So <laughs> there are a lot of applications, um, you know, as, as, a, as an adult and what I uh, talk about with a lot of like my friends is like, well, you do like geology, you definitely like your granite countertop, right? So anyway, um, just some fun facts there, but we'll continue on. All right, so broad swaths in geology. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to spend less time on this, um, but in general, when I'm referring to geologic dates, I'm talking about things that are really, really old. You can see on here, I mean, we go back like very, very far. Um, when I'm talking about Precambrian, it's super old stuff. Um, so just bear that in mind as we go through. Holocene is very recent deposits. Um, of of rocks so um or sediments most likely sediments but um where we are anyway but uh yeah so just in general if you're not familiar with the geologic time scale it's changed a lot over time um you know this is a science um we uh we learn new things as we go and uh and we see new things that can help better define like what some of these dates are um, there's a lot of different ways to date things also. I won't dive too much into that, but just in general, like I, I want you guys to know um, what we're talking about when we're talking about Precambrian is super old. Um, so how this relates to South Carolina, uh, the Appalachian Mountains were actually formed in the late Paleozoic era, era, excuse me, era. And so that was about 340, 200 million years ago. Um, so excuse me, 342 million years ago, and it was caused by three main mountain building events or orogeny is what I mentioned earlier. So there was the Taconic, um, which happened actually in um, the middle or division, so right, right around this time. So, and then we moved to the Acadian um, orogeny, which was middle to late Devonian right here. And then one that I think most of you guys know is the Allegheny, and that took place in the late Carboniferous to Permian. If you know anything like about the mountain building events, like oftentimes you've heard of the Allegheny for um, the mountain mountain building event that um, like took place that created Appalachia. Um, so that all happened um, when uh, when. Africa collided with North America, basically. So th there are a lot of like, there are a lot of deformation events that happen, but just in general, it's just, it's cool to like imagine you have these two plates that are just like colliding and they form these, these massive mountains. And honestly, like, it's really cool. Our, our mountains are very weathered and have been very weathered over time, which makes sense. They're super old. Um, and it, and that also um, is, attributes to, you know, why we see so much uh, sedimentation, like, in the, like, you know, bottom area of our state also. So moving east towards our coastline, um, we've had a lot of weathering processes. All right, and what I want you to remember, Cenozoic, that's more recent, Precambrian, very old. Okay, so this is like, again, part of our crash course, fundamental geologic principles. It makes sense when you think about it. Most of these things do because we're thinking about it. Um, a lot of this can be attributed to like just density and uh, gravity, to be honest. So if you think about density and gravity, you know, like if you, saw, if you drop something on the ground, it's gonna lay relatively flat, flat right? So um, you see here, this, this consideration of original horizontality um, we're not going to see this kind of deformation, um, like a, like a little wave like this might see it in, usually it's like a little bit funkier if you're looking at like a cross section of a sand dune. Um, but in general, in general, you'll see sediment laid on top like this. Um, and then you have deformation that occurs after the fact. So that's original horizontality. Um, superposition, the, um, the beds that you see on the bottom are older than the beds you see on the top. You, you know, you can't deposit like below another bed. Now you have, um, it, once, once you start looking at it at a broader scale, um, now if we have any geologists that are part of this, um, you might see like an overturned, 
um, fold of some kind. And in that case, you might see a demonstration of like, oh, why, why is this younger bed on top far below an older one? And then you know that you've got a fold there. Something else has happened, some other deformation. But in general, when things are deposited, this is the way they're deposited. So anyway, cross-cutting relationships. Um, older rocks are bisected by younger rocks. This makes sense, right? Like we wouldn't, like we can't bisect a rock unless it was already there. So think about this um, in relation to like a granitic uh, pluton. So you have, you have this older rock and then you have a magma, think of it like a bubble. Magma bubble forms and it moves like up or it cuts through like this younger rock here, cuts through and you see this, this vein here. Um, so this is, we know this is younger than this. And, and this helps us figure out um, like ages of things. Uh, and it gets very convoluted once you get into that upstate oftentimes because um, we've had so much metamorphism up here. But this is just generally what we wanna consider when we're looking at an area, it becomes especially you know, important when we're, when we're looking at um, you know, newer depositional environments like what we would find on the coast. So yeah, in my memory, I have a couple of questions, but I do have a comment. Yeah. I think I told you before I uh, failed miserably at one of these little graphs because <laughs> uh, I really like geology, but it drove me crazy. And I still remember it 20 years later that I didn't do well on, on this one right here. So. Oh, I find it hard to believe. <laughs> I but still I do. Know. One is, well, it's, it's, I've heard that the earth's plates move at the speed that fingernails grow. So when Africa collided here, it wasn't like a car crash. It was more of a slow no. mush. I it guess. was pretty slow moving, but um, I will say, you know, we have earthquakes. We have, we have fault systems that can move pretty quickly. Um, if you're out in California, there's a lot more, there's a lot more like, that's a, you know, that's a convergent like margin um, in a lot of areas. You, you see a lot more of that movement like firsthand. Like you can see streams that have gone like this just based on a fault. So it, it's different across the board. Um, so, you know, a lot of times like, yeah, it's, you know, we see things move at kind of like that uh, at that level. But like when you get an earthquake, if you get like, you know, some substantial rock movement and, and there's been like a big, a big movement happening, there can be some serious uh, repercussions, which is why they've done a lot of research to try and like find out when those things are going to happen on the West Coast. Um, I've actually done a little bit of research out there um, in college and we were doing an instrumentation project um, actually to try and predict um, a seismic event off the coast of the like, Pacific Northwest um, because if we were to have an earthquake or some sort of like substantial movement of rock in an area like that, it could be hugely detrimental to cities like Seattle that are on the coast. So well, um, just something to consider. Not all rocks move the same rate, um, but yeah, like in, in our case, like a lot of a lot of the time they move like fingernails. So yeah. Well, and that kind of lines up with uh, another question. It says, what changes yeah. future? What changes in the future do you predict in the Earth's substance? Now, I don't know what that means, but like. Yeah, OK, so I think I understand that question. And I will say um, a lot of the reason that we know the things that we do today are because we're observing current processes. So think about the coastline. Um, you can see you can see transgression and regression of sea level. And if you if you drill a soil core down, you can see different um, you know, different lithologies uh, based on that, you might see fluff mud uh, beneath, beneath a coastal sand. And then you know that like, yeah, the beach is creeping back, like sea level is rising. There's a transgression going on. So when we look at the geologic record, that's what we use. Um, I, I don't foresee a ton of changes as far as the geologic record goes because it's so comprehensive, but we're learning stuff that's new every single day in this field. It's very fascinating. Um, but, you know, we have sea, sea level rises happening. Um, you know, that's something that that is is changing. So in some ways, when sea level changes, like it changes the depositional environment for a certain area. Same as like with an ice age, um, you know, when you have 
kind of like a retraction of sea level, um, you see, you see different things too, but I don't know if there's like a different depositional environment that would pop up <laughs> in, in the next like few years, like that we haven't seen before. This is a, this is a very comprehensive, um, Geologi science. So geological time is a little bit different than just our time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, yeah. Yeah. Thanks absolutely. For that, uh, thanks for that. Um, awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, overview of mineralogy and petrology. And I do want to get to like the good stuff. I know we're here for habitat and, and finding out how all of this relates to actually our South Carolina habitat. So, but this is actually something that as like a hobbyist geologist, um, in a lot of ways, because they're not always applications of this in my field, I am like fascinated by. Um, so, Petrology is study of rocks, and a rock is actually an aggregate of minerals. I think I mentioned this earlier, but think about it like, you know, you got all these like these little things that are kind of different, and then they've just been meshed all together. Um, you have lots of different elements that they want, they want to actually like form like a, a crystal or a structure. They're they're more easily um, bound to each other. So those actually become different minerals. There are tons of different mineral structures. Um, they're different like types of minerals. Um, excuse me, um, a, lot of, a lot of the minerals that we see actually um, in South Carolina, um, especially in the coastal regions by that point, um, we're mostly seeing like silica minerals, um, but there, there are lots of different kinds. You know, we have like, we have sulfide minerals too. Um, you know, we see what I was mentioning earlier, earlier about like hydrothermal systems. We see some, some of those like precipitate out in hydrothermal systems also. Um, but it's, it's fascinating actually to see kind of the different structure that you might see. So um, anyway, some minerals are created and weathered more readily than others. Um, in terms of silica uh, minerals, there is a, there's a fun diagram, which I think is fun, <laughs> called Bowen's Reaction Series. And it helps explain which minerals actually form um, more quickly than others. So um, you might see like a mineral like olivine forming um, before something like quartz. Um, so olivine is worn very quickly. Um, it doesn't last very long. Same with feldspar. Um, feldspar is long gone. Um, in a weathering situation before quartz is. That's why we have very, very quartz rich beaches here um, rather than some other type of mineral. So this is what most people know. It's the three rock types. We got igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. We've got all three in South Carolina. Um, I'm not sure if there's states where you don't have all three. I, I don't know that off the top of my head, but I know that we have um, we have pretty good uh, representation of all three in South Carolina. So, um, if you're if you're familiar with this um, rock cycle at all, I think it's pretty cool to see uh, sandstone and uh, and limestone are are uh, sedimentary rocks. Um, you see those in like depositional environments. They get compacted and then they lithify, which means that they become a rock. Um, so then. Um, we move oftentimes into metamorphic rocks when you get some heat and pressure. Um, you can move like all around here. So like you get a metamorphic rock, it goes through weathering and erosion, becomes a sedimentary rock again. Um, with igneous rocks, you might have a granite like our, uh, our blue granite that we mentioned earlier, um, which is an intrusive, meaning it's below Earth's surface. Um, form below Earth's surface allowed to cool and gives it that that crystalline, uh, that crystalline texture that's known as phaneritic, uh, fun fact. Um, and you might, or you might get basalt. Um, we don't have any active volcanoes here. Hopefully we don't get any anytime soon. <laughs> we have had them before, but um, we don't see, we don't see that this is happening anytime soon because we're not like on, on an area that has a hot spot or some sort of convergent plate boundary, but um, Basalt is a super cool rock. If you've been to Hawaii, that's that's what is out there. So um, I'll, for a lot of the thin sections that I look at, I look at basalt um, or, or gabbro. Um, so anyway, um, so this is just in general, like what the rock cycle is. A lot of times we'll see stuff that is considered like 
meta igneous rock. And that just means that it's an igneous rock. Um, um, it's, excuse me, it's, it's a metamorphic rock of an igneous origin. So like you might see like a gneiss um, that has, that's been created because of um, heat and pressure on a granite. Um, so there, there's some funny terms like that. Um, basically, if you parse them up, it's like, oh, that, that generally makes sense, so. Hi. <laughs> well, an, uh, a few questions actually. So which, oh. which of those is the most prominent here in South Carolina? Ooh, that's a toughie. Um, I would say as far as rock types, uh, we have a lot of metamorphic rock here, um, for sure. Uh, we have tons of metamorphic rock. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of like stratigraphy and stuff that's like unlithified that's at the surface. Um, that's Ooh, I have generally no quartz rich. What's that? I said, I didn't, I didn't understand what you just said. <laughs> okay, so. Um, we have things that aren't actually rocks, you know, in the Midlands area, we have sand hills, right? So if we're, if we're thinking about the most prominent types of rock or something that, um, like the most commonly found, we have a lot of metamorphic rocks. And honestly, that might be a little skewed because that's kind of like the area that I live in. I see a lot of metamorphic rocks, but, um, to be honest, um, I'm not sure what the exact, like, uh, predominant rock type is um, in South Carolina, what that would be considered to be. Um, but that's a good question. Yeah. Um, and we had another one. This was kind of cool. It says uh, this person very rarely found rocks in Florida. Were they covered with sand? Yes. So um, a, a lot of rocks are actually, they're down there, but they're, they're pretty far down. So you have a lot of unconsolidated sediment that may be atop, um, atop the actual rock um, down there. I do quite a bit of work in Florida. They have some pretty cool rocks actually. So karst is, all, is also considered a rock. Um, that's a pretty common rock actually in Florida. Um, it can be a little bit scary um, if, if you're doing a lot of work in a karst because um, it actually it dissolves very easily. It's a rock that dissolves super easily. It doesn't have these like quartz um, minerals that are, um, are super you know, super tough and like can withstand, um, you know, a lot of uh, weathering processes. So even if you have like a skewed pH, it can, it can dissolve a, a lime, limey rock or like a, or, or excuse me, or a karst. Um, but anyway, side note about karst, I think it's pretty <laughs> and, nice. and side note, they have a lot of manatees uh, in Florida. And if you haven't they seen do. It, and it's, it, they, they have to be there because of some kind of <laughs> Yes, uh, calcium carbonate, exactly. Oh yeah, wow, look at that. So uh, last yeah. question, uh, and then I'll let you move on there. Uh, any any active faults in South Carolina? There are, yes. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about the earthquake that happened um, in the Charleston area. Um, there is a fault in Somerville that's, uh, that's relatively active. I mean, I've heard, you know, uh, people who actually studied hazards say that like, you know, we could be due for one. Um, they have some pretty strict building codes, um, I know, because of the awareness of that fault, um, specifically. You have to build things into, into like a marl. Um, a, lot of, a lot of Charleston is actually previous like landfill um, that was extended like off the peninsula. So you gotta be careful about liquefaction that could happen in those areas too. Um, but yeah, we do have active, active uh, faulting in South Carolina, not quite as active as what we would see um, out West um, in a lot of cases, but it is, it is, it is here, so. All right, yeah. awesome. thank you. And, you know, I'll let you move on. We have some more questions, but, you know, okay. please feel free to stay afterwards, uh, folks, um, and, and ask questions if we don't get to them, but uh, we have to continue. Thanks, yeah. Mike. Mm -hmm. Awesome, all right. Okay, so overview of South Carolina geology here. All right, as you can see, there's a lot going on um, in South Carolina um, as far as geology goes. And a lot of this is stuff that you might not necessarily see. We see a lot of outcrops um, actually like in the upstate area of different rock types. Um, it's, it's harder to see them, honestly, um, because we don't have the, the, same, um, the same types of, uh, of like a font or flora that they have like out west um, where you like you might have more desert you can you can easily see these outcrops um, 
our, our South Carolina geology lends itself to having abundant flora. And, uh, and sometimes you have to get in there like with a rock hammer and actually like take a look or do some drilling. So anyway, um, this, is, this is what we see um, as far as like a very generalized, even this is super generalized geologic map. I would encourage you guys to get on the USGS website and actually like look up some of this stuff um, and take a look and see where you are in South Carolina. Um, like, you know, what is going on um, as far as like the different rock types that you might, might come across. Okay, so for the purposes of our discussion, and this is a hugely broad swath. If you're a geologist, you'll be like, what? Like, we're just gonna go over like the physiographic provinces, just like the very main ones in South Carolina. So that can, that includes the Blue Ridge, um, also includes the Piedmont area, um, where you see, where you see, you know, some of this, uh, this more weathered material. And then we have the fall line, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And that's very relevant to the type of species and habitat that we see. Um, and then we have coastal plains. So I'm including the Sand Hills region in the coastal plain. Um, also kind of including um, like part of our margin um, off coast in the coastal plain as well, because we see the same processes generally. Um, we see very active coastal processes like right on the coast and offshore. But um, at one point, uh, the coastal plain was part of this higher stand of sea level. So pretty cool stuff. Okay, all right, so we got the Blue Ridge. All right, so this is a little bit more of an in-depth um, geologic map of our area. This includes part of the Piedmont too. Um, so just pay attention to this area right up here, just like the very tip top. Um, that is our, our Blue Ridge right here. Um, you guys may have visited the Blue Ridge Mountains. I mentioned this earlier, um, but the Blue Ridge is part of the Appalachian Mountain Range. It was created by uplifting of Earth's tectonic plates. Um, one uh, generally about 1.1 billion to 25 million years ago. Um, so there's some of the oldest mountains in the world. Um, so the I guess the the oldest that we know of um, in the world are in South Africa. Um, so there's like greenstone belt in South Africa that are even older. Um, but the, these rocks generally include gneisses, um, schists, um, pegmatites, amphibolites, um, some really, really beautiful rock types up here. Um, and then they, they're formed by the heat and pressure that was applied um, to original sediments and um, volcanic rocks um, of the Precambrian continental shelf. So um, that's just kind of a general overview um, how this applies to us, let's just, as an example, take like a tiny bit of gneiss that's knocked off a boulder and from the Tallulah Falls formation um, that was formed during these orogenies. This was once a granite that had been metamorphosed um, during this time. And it's got a whole slew of different types of minerals. You got um, amphibolite, quartz, feldspar, um, it's, you know, a really cool, like, little specimen of rock. So it's knocked into a stream here, um, and it tumbles, and it gets that, like, you know, very rounded um, appearance that we see in some of these mountain streams. So um, just think about that. I'll talk about that more later. Um, so these are, these are just some pics. Um, Jay shared one of these earlier. This is with actually some of my, uh, my geology and um, environmental consulting buddies over at, um, at the Table Rock uh, State Park, if you've ever been there. And then actually that bottom picture is um, from a, it's from a trail um, that is from a weight facility. If you're not familiar with that, that's a South Carolina Wildlife Federation program. Um, it's, wildlife and industry together. So that facility is um, associated with Duke. It's a really, really beautiful trail system that they have. Um, and that, that waterfall is gorgeous. If you're ever in the upstate, um, please visit White Waterfalls. It's a beautiful area. So it, another place of uh, Sassafras uh, Mountain, that's the highest, highest elevation point in South Carolina. Um, so you know, if you've ever, if you've ever been to the upstate, you're kind of like overlooking the Blue Ridge. We don't, we don't have a ton of it in South Carolina, but 
um, you can see, you know, we, we have abundant um, flora, so you can't always see the outcropping of rock. All right, Piedmont. So the Piedmont system, you see a lot of different rock types here as well. Um, similar processes formed these. Um, so I won't go over like all of that in detail, but you know, for the sake of um, of uh, time, I'm just gonna discuss. Um, Paris Mountain is a great a great location to see um, these rock types. Uh, Falls uh, Falls Park actually in Greenville is pretty cool. Um, that's a that's a really neat area to actually um, you know witness uh, typical like Piedmont uh, geology. Um, so you know check that out. And uh, then left is a picture from Liberty Hill. Um, you can see that a lot of the weathering patterns have lent itself to a lot of like oxidization, and there's a lot of highly weathered rock in this area. Um, which we would refer to like a saprolite. Um, so highly weathered rock um, helps, uh, it kind of helps feed kind of our coastal um, plain, which we'll, we'll discuss next. And if you think about that little particle that I was mentioning earlier in the Blue Ridge, it's tumbling down the stream. As it starts to you know, get broken down and weathered more, those feldspars disappear because those are more weather, more uh, readily weathered, um, they, they leave pretty quickly. So, you know, around this time, maybe the size of a pretty large like sand grain goes over the top of Falls Park. Um, that waterfall it tumbles downstream on the reedy. Um, you know, that's sediment transport. So uh, pretty cool to imagine like how some of this stuff like gets weathered over time. Okay. All right, coastal plain, very quickly. Um, you guys might be pretty familiar with this. This is a big, big portion of the state. Um, and you know, this, this is where like active, um, active uh, coastal processes took place during higher and lower stands of sea level. Um, so I mentioned the sand hills earlier and I could talk like pretty in depth about just the sand hills alone, to be honest. Um, but that area is generally around the Columbia area. Um, it's interpreted as Eolian, which means that it's windblown. Um, and they're like big paleo dune features. Um, you see kind of like the rolling hills, like in the Sand Hills area. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so they were generally deposited about um, 75 uh, to as recent as like 6,000 years ago, which is pretty incredible. Um, and the, the sands are um, coincident with uh, the last glaciation. Um, so you have like colder winds um, or stronger winds and colder air, um, less vegetation. Uh, so it, it's pretty, um, pretty amazing to see just kind of how, uh, you know, sea level uh, transgression, regression, and climate can can uh, affect um, the geology of an entire state in this capacity. So, um, all right. So I also mentioned that I included um, like portions of the shelf slope area. Um, I mean, these are these are where you know current coastal um, processes and depth and uh, deposition are happening. You know, around our inlets, um, longshore current uh, sediment transport. Um, you see um, some of these like bumpy features out here. Uh, some of those are actually attributed to um, paleodeltaic features. So basically old deltas from a much lower stand of sea level. Um, so that, that's some pretty cool stuff. You can actually look and map like the bathymetry off the coastline um, and see some variations um, that that are attributed to lower stands of sea level. So this is my maybe what you might picture these kind of these pine areas um, in in the coastal plain. Those are some great habitat. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's some pretty cool stuff. And then this is our coastline right here. Um, obviously, I think most of us have spent some time on the beach, but. Um, you know what I was talking about earlier with uh, with sediment transport. Generally in South Carolina, it's uh, north to south 
Um, that's how like the sediment transport moves. So we get these beautiful um, barrier island systems um, along, along our coast, which are, um, are pretty unique. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more about the fall line, but we're kind of running out of time. So I'll just touch, touch on this. Um, the fall line is actually like where um, we see a change um, from where these out rock outcrops are um, of the Piedmont, and then they meet like these softer sedimentary formations in the coastal plain. So um, it's very much linked to the geology of the area. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more um, with some of the uh, different types of organisms that we see, you know, below or above the fall line, depending on the types of habitat. Yeah, and can, can I just mention about, you know, the, one of the cool things about the, the coastal plain and then the Piedmont and then the, the Blue Ridge area, um, you know, we were talking about the, the rat, eastern rat snake before. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the eastern rat snake, it's, it's very, very dark. They call it the black rat snake, right, in the, in the northern parts of the state. And even where I am, I'm above Lake Murray, just barely in Chapin, and we, we get some black rat snakes as well in the, in the mm -hmm. lower Piedmont. But once you start going, I mean, I'm just talking about 10 miles down the road or 15 miles down the road, we start getting to the Congaree National Park. And well, maybe a little bit further than that, 20, but you know, you can see the yellow, uh, yellowish green rat, rat snake, which is still an Eastern rat snake, but yeah. you know, just, just imagine being a, an Eastern rat snake um, and you're a Northern species, but you find yourself in the coastal plain in these lighter, you know, habitats, like look at the grass here, look at the, you know, you stick out like a sore th thumb on these, uh, in these sandier areas. So if mm -hmm. you're yellow though, um, or if you're yellowish green, you you really kind of blend in. So uh, in the middle, though, you know, I've, I've seen at Saluda Shoals, which is right here outside of Columbia, kind of in the middle of the state, right? Um, you can kind of get a, a gray form. So kind of kind of right there in the in the middle. Um, but, you know, the same, same thing with the timber rattlesnake, you know, the when you're in the mountains, they're, they're quite a bit darker than when you go to the, the coastal plains, you know, same species, some people call them cane break, uh, but they're, they're, they're a lot lighter uh, in mm -hmm. color than, than the, than the ones up, up in the upper state. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's super fascinating. Yeah, um, really, like, really cool stuff on how that affects the, uh, just how, how species look. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a pretty cool actually to see, um, you know, like how animals, you know, adapt um, to their environment. How are they going to be better suited to live there? So, you know, the the uh, the snakes that are better suited live on. They're able to reproduce. I think that's a, that's pretty fascinating, right? Um, so we'll we will mention more of those examples in a minute. Um, so just in general, just to kind of reiterate. Um, We've gone over some very broad physiographic profit, uh, uh, excuse me, areas of um, South Carolina. There are, there are a lot more defined areas. Um, I would encourage you to look up on G, uh, uh, USGS, that map and look in your region, see what formation is there. Um, if you need help and trying to access that, or if you wanna know, please send me an email. Um, so on a regional scale, um, these geologic processes uh, really like hugely shape our landscape. We have weathering, we have all the sediment transport. Um, and in general, like we have these like massive like geomorphological features um, that are awesome and perfect habitat um, oftentimes for certain types of wildlife. So, um, so I'm not an ecologist. I'll go ahead and open and say that. Jay is going to help me out a little bit on, um, on some of these, but we'll, we'll fly through them because I know we're running out of time. Um, yeah. oh, and folks, we, we probably have like six or seven more minutes until we get yeah. to that hour. But if you want to hang out with us, please do. We're, we're just getting into the, the wildlife stuff. But um, we will yeah. But, you know, when we think about our state, if you want to go one slide back, yeah. you know, and talk about those formations, talk about the history, you know, our state has, you know, there's a great book. It's called A Guide to, uh, to the Wildflowers of South Carolina. If you don't have it, I don't know if you can see it or not. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, but, you know, it, it talks about the 31, over 3,100 different species of vascular plants, you know, plants with roots that they can, you know, suck up the water and the minerals and, and distribute it throughout their bodies. 
um, you know, in South Carolina. Well, Georgia, you know, is almost twice the size of South Carolina, and they have around a thousand different or, or a thousand more, you know. So, uh, you know, we've got three fourths of what they have with half the size. And then North Carolina, you know, probably has about five or six hundred uh, more vascular plants than us, but they're fifty percent larger than we are. So. Uh, that's attributed to just this, the, the, the rock or the different formations that we have, uh, the landforms that we have, um, you know, the, the mountains that we have, and then the coastal plain, um, you know, we, we get the, we're, we're, we're the northernmost area for some of the Florida species, and then we're the southernmost area of some of the, you know, northern species from, you know, some of them that are endemic to, uh, you know, North Carolina, um, but we get some of those. Yeah. Uh, for that area. So, you know, we're really diverse. And, you know, when we have plant diversity as well, we're going to have insect diversity. And when we have that, we're going to have, you know, animal diversity. So I just wanted to kind of speak to that because. Yeah. That's yeah. So, yeah, just bear that in mind. I mean, there's so many other applications to this. I'm sure you guys can actually name like 100 other examples of how, um, you know, different species are, um, you know, well suited to a certain environment and how that could relate back to geology. So, all right, so we'll start with one of my favorites. I've never actually seen one, but I'm dying to. Um, Eastern Hellbender Salamander. So these are actually the largest salamanders in the US. Um, this is another one that's super well suited to its environment. They have great camouflage, they're blotchy brown, red brown, um, with a paler underbelly. Um, they've been known to grow up to a little over two feet in length. Can you imagine seeing one of these in a mountain stream? Have any of y'all seen one of these? I just love to know. So um, I, I hike a lot and I've never seen one, but um, I would love to. And just like other salamander types, um, they like to live in, um, in shallow, fast flowing, rocky streams. That is their, that's their perfect location. Um, and as an amphibian, uh, they, they breathe through their skin and then they rely on that cool, well-oxygenated water. Um, so it's, it's really important. Um, they're, a, they're a pretty big bioindicator species. If a stream system is unhealthy, um, you know, that unfortunately uh, salamanders and amphib other amphibians are, uh, you know, what we see um, like hurting. Uh, so anyway, Eastern Hellbender Salamander are super, super cool. Um, so mm -hmm. they, you can see that they're kind of, um, they're kind of positioned in this region right here. And then you can, I mean, look at, this is a, like an Appalachian um, mountain map. Uh, you can see the overlaid, it's, it's pretty similar in terms of uh, location in general, so. Um, another plant that we would find um, in the uh, Blue Ridge area of South Carolina is the mountain sweet pitcher plant. Um, and this is uh, pretty limited in terms of, um, of location. It's only found along a few stream sides um, in the Blue Ridge Mountains in South Carolina. Um, I've seen a few of these. They're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, and they're um, actually an insectivorous species um, and they're native to these bog lands. So uh, there are other coastal plain species of these, but uh, the mountain sweet pitcher plant is actually the one that is affiliated with uh, the Blue Ridge. So um, it's pretty seriously threatened um, by collectors because it is such a beautiful plant. Um, but if you, if you see them, um, it's a great plant to report that you have, you've seen it. Um, just so we're aware of like how many are left. All right, another one, the ruffed grouse. Um, similar location actually to, to our um, pitcher plant buddy over here. And uh, these love these uh, mountain laurel and rhododendron thickets in the upstate area. Um, I have actually, I don't have it seen a rough grouse um, in my ventures up here either. I think they're, they're generally a pretty limited, a um, little bit, a limited population, right, Jay? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I think around 2018, DNR was wanting folks to go out. You know, there's these great apps that you can have on your phone now. You know, iNaturalist is one of them. So if you do see a pitcher plant, you know, that's that's one of those uh, those apps that you can use to kind of report it. And then it goes out to, to scientists and it's really great. 
Um, but uh, yeah, rough grouse, they, they want more people to go out and, and try to uh, see how many, you know, that they can either see or hear. Um, so not really a game species here just because there are so few of them from, from what I've read. Uh, mm -hmm. I've never seen one here in South Carolina, but they are here. You know, some mm -hmm. have heard them drumming, uh, some have, you know, seen, seen some around here, but not a really common bird, but just kind of cool that we have that, you know, it's a Northern species right here in South Carolina, you know, we're, we're yeah. pretty far South, but other, other birds too, since I'm, I'm a bird geek, you know, um, we get you know, the sc scarlet tanagers, you're going to find those, some of the most beautiful birds, in my opinion, in the world, you know, that come all the way up here from Columbia, South America to breed in our state. You know, we don't, y'all don't have those down in the coast. Y'all have mm -hmm. other birds that, that they might not have up there, but, um, you know, they have the scarlet tanagers. You might find a chestnut sided warbler breeding up there, a yellow warbler breeding up there. Um, Baltimore Orioles, you know, there's there's birds, you know, that I don't have right here in Chapin, which isn't too, too far from there, but they exist there because of the geologic, you know, history um, and the mountains um, and just the elevation and, and the food sources there. So, yeah. yeah, and that just that little sliver uh, because of, you know, the the, the past, the, the history, um, you know, they, they support, you know, this awesome diversity of birds. And and not to mention, you know, the salamanders, you mentioned the, the hellbender, but think about the dozens of species of, of salamanders that are that are uh, sure to be up there. Absolutely. Um, yeah, a lot of this is linked, um, actually, to the types of um, flora that can grow in a certain area. A lot of these um, species actually, you know, feed on uh, types of, you know, types of like, fruit um, of sorts, berries, seeds, um, leaves um, from different types of trees that, or bushes or things of that like that actually can exist in these areas based on, um, you know, soil type or, um, you know, the, the preference of a rocky outcrop over um, like a well-saturated acidic soil, um, those types of things. So um, just some other things to consider um, as we go through this list. Okay. Um, all right, spider lilies. Has anybody actually been to Lansford Canal State Park? Um, I know that I saw a lot of uh, activity around this this time this uh, this year actually, um, and they're really super well uh, suited um, these spider lilies uh, to this area in particular um, of Lower Piedmont um, around the fall line. Um, oh, I'm seeing, yeah, a lot of people have been. That's really cool. So that's on my bucket list too. I have not been. Um, but the types of rocks that we actually see in this area are uh, meta igneous rocks. So instead of like a meta sedimentary rock, um, where like we might have like a flatter, like flatter uh, rocks that like, you know, aren't, you know, outcropping like over um, for the, these boulders that aren't rounded. Um, I think, I mean, this is kind of like a, you know, an interpretation, but I think these spider lilies are actually super well suited um, to growing on these meta igneous rocks because um, because of the shape and um, you know the ability for them to like root um, on rocks that are kind of like rounded and um, you know broken up and um, you know they can they can actually um, you know if it were a different type of rock it might be too flat and they couldn't they couldn't germinate um, because they wouldn't be close enough to like sunlight so pretty cool stuff um and i would absolutely love to see this area um and hopefully will by next year well, um i think i've missed it <laughs> we, had some, we had some folks uh talk about seeing these over 126 right here in columbia you know by riverbank to, um, you know, you can see the, the Broad River and the Saluda River, you know, form the Congaree right there. And uh, you can see them from there. And, uh, you know, it, it always makes me think about how uh, fast flowing. I mean, they are just mm -hmm. ripping through that area when, when we've had a lot of rain. And yet these, these spider lilies are there year after year after year. So imagine how well, you know, wedged in that they are to that, th that those rock formations there. Yeah. And they wouldn't be there if it hadn't been for the geologic past, you know, I, I think it's yeah. so cool. So we get to, we get to enjoy things that have been mm -hmm. in the works mm -hmm. for millions and millions of years, you know? Yeah. It's pretty awesome to see, you know, how something that is so beautiful can be linked um, to our geologic setting as well. So, all right. Um, okay. So American alligator in the cotton mouth. Um, so juxtaposed to our friend, the hellbender um, in the upstate, 
these guys actually like to live below the fall line. Um, that is the area that they're most well suited. They, they would prefer to live below the Piedmont. Um, they like to live in freshwater habitats like cypress swamps, river floodplains, heavily vegetated wetlands. They like the slow moving um, areas, not any fast movement. You know, if you've ever seen an alligator hanging out, he just, he doesn't want to be in a fast moving stream. He would prefer to be sitting on a log, um, sunning himself uh, and, and just waiting for, for something to come by. So um, pretty cool stuff. Um, Jay, I think we were talking about earlier, um, your dad mentioned something about uh, an area of Lake Murray he had seen yeah. water moccasin. And the water moccasin. I don't. Do you have that map of the uh, fall line there? Um, yes, I do. Yeah, this one right here. So mm -hmm. you know, I grew up on Lake Murray. Um, you know, in the middle of the plate, maybe favor, favors the western side a little bit. But um, you know, my as far as I know and I understand, DNR has never really reported a water moccasin on Lake Murray. A lot of people would say, "Oh no, you're full of it," but it's it, it's the truth. So. Uh, where it's above the fall line, right? But there's this little teeny kind of mitten um, in the fall line that kind of nudges the southern part of Lake Murray, kind of close to the dam. And my father, you know, um, said years and years ago that he remembers being with a buddy around that area, kind of close to the dam on the Lexington side and seeing one coiled up with the mouth open and it was white. Well, that can't really be any other um, snake than, <laughs> than the cotton mouth, right? Cotton mouth, white, white mouth. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was looking at this map and I was like, man, that, that really makes sense. So, you know, he was right at the southern part of Lake Murray. Now, 40 years ago, Lake Murray didn't have all the thousands of houses that it, that it has now. Uh -huh. um, and it might have been OK habitat. I would imagine, you know, that area right now because of Lexington's population growth, it, it probably doesn't support any. But um, yeah. And then, you know, uh, they stay below the fall line, like Montgomery said, real slow moving water. You know, if you're a golfer in the coastal plain and you hit a bad ball, you know, close to water, you really <laughs> have to you really have to start wondering if you should take that drop in a safer area. You know, right. <laughs> they, uh, you know water moccasins. Um, but where Edgefield and McCormick are along the Savannah River, you know, that forms the border of South Carolina and Georgia or part of it, um, you know, water moccasins do go past the fall line. Um, you know, I don't know how commonly because I don't I don't go to that area. I've never studied down there, um, but they have been reported and uh, they kind of follow the, the river up there. Um, it's it's uh, a, along this kind of coastal terrace, um, just following that river from the coastal plain to uh, across the fall line. So there are, you know, water moccasins that can live up. I don't know how far north, but they are reported above the fall line there. But, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the rest of the state, it's it's going to be super rare to either have an alligator or a uh, water moccasin north of that fall line, just because they don't, you know, as, as far as I understand, they don't like the habitat. They don't like that faster moving water. Um, mm -hmm. They don't like how clear it is. You know, they'd rather be in the, that slower uh, moving, darker water. Yeah, exactly. And just like, you know, we we have like a place over um, like near kind of near watery. And I know there have been sightings of like alligators and stuff like in, in Lake Watery as well. Um, but, you know, that something to bear in mind um, with some of these locations is that the depositional environment has been changed um, by the um, implementation of dam systems. So um, you, you might see uh, some things that like maybe are a little bit different um, from like the normal geologic um, structure of an area and that it, it might be because it's man-made. Um, you know, we, we can control a lot of uh, depositional environments based on engineering controls alone. So um, just something to consider. Uh, you might see some variations. So I'm not saying that they don't exist, but uh, in general, they would prefer to be in the coastal plain. Okay, red cockaded woodpecker. Um, so these are another um, area. It's kind of, they're actually kind of uh, secluded um, to like a few areas of um, a forest in South Carolina. Is that correct, Jay? Um, like they're pretty rare birds. There's quite a few pockets of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so they prefer the coastal plain and they prefer pine specifically. Um, and pine forests are very, very prevalent in the Sand Hills area because they're sandy, um, pretty acidic. Um, you have this like highly weathered 
um, silica sand in these areas, it's kind of perfect conditions for pines. Um, if you're into like, you know, into trees, um, you know that like, yeah, this is an area of the world, you're gonna be able to see some like, some beautiful pine trees. Um, but, you know, a lot of species that actually live in these areas have been affected because um, of the lack of burning in some instances. Um, a lot of these areas have been um, are, um, extensively logged um, and replaced with other types of pine species. I think uh, red cockaded woodpeckers like prefer like longleaf pines typically. Um, and that's, that's true of like a lot of different animals. So they can be impacted a lot by by the lack of a specific type of flora um, that used to thrive in an area, um, just based on on you know different things happening. So, yeah, and they don't um, like it when when the uh, the understory gets too thick and it gets yeah. too hot, so they need that burning. You know, so Francis Marion has has a great population. You know, Donnelly. Um, somebody had mentioned Fort Jackson, and and mm. they do have them, um, but they do prescribe burns there. So you have to keep that you know a very prairie like um, habitat under those nice tall pine trees um yeah and yeah. so you know other things you know that you can find uh in these areas uh you know when you think about these softer sands um they're you know pretty dry they they drain really really nicely um mm -hmm. and they're soft right i mean i just remember my yes. dad because i grew up on again on the south side of lake murray but in the piedmont just he gets real high pitched whenever he's irritated and he talked about <laughs> Oh, I can't dig through this clay. And, you know, he's from know. Ohio and he had nice soft dirt up there. And, uh, you know, he would talk about how hard it is to dig in the clay. Well, think about, you know, these, a lot of these fossorial or, you know, sub subterranean species, or they spend a lot of time underground, like the coral, coral snake that we have. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they like these, you know, uh, these pockets of sandy areas um, here in South Carolina. You think about the gopher tortoise, you know, it's not going to be, it probably isn't going to be digging and making, making those burrows in clay, right? It likes, you know, these, these, um, these sandy loose soil areas in the coastal plain. Uh, and then Absolutely. With, you have these gopher tortoise, then you have these pine snakes, right? That are sometimes living in these burrows. Um, sometimes one of these, uh, longleaf pines or a tree there you know gets hit by lightning and it, and it dies and then all of a sudden you have this nice little burrow under the tree where the root system was um and you will have like diamondback rattlesnakes which are in pretty darn big decline in that in that outer coastal plain um so you have all these amazing species think about the scarlet um king snake you know that kind of looks like the coral snake you know it, mm -hmm. it's living in these you know sandy looser soil areas whereas where i am i'm not going to find one I, I might find the scarlet snake but not the scarlet king probably here uh, but you know you, you find these gorgeous gorgeous species down there that is specific uh uh, to to that era because of geology <laughs> and I just think that's really cool yeah it, it's pretty fascinating once you start to see the connections you see them everywhere um so it's pretty cool to look at a look at you know some of the combinations you overlay a geologic map and then you overlay like you know the regional um range of some of these species um I, it certainly opened my eyes even at like going through the research process for this um seeing everything uh that is, uh, you know, there in the links well, between them. Somebody had just mentioned some eels, and and it just makes me think of you know glass lizards around the beach and and around the the mm -hmm. hills um, and around the coastal plain. You know, that's that's again not something that we see too commonly um, in the Piedmont area because yeah. you know, we're too compact here. The the soil right. is, we have clay. You know, it's it's too rocky. Yeah, so, yeah. There's, there's a great diversity of, of things that we don't even get really, you know, here, if we get it. I know, not, not I know. We, we are very, very lucky in South Carolina to have so many different, um, different types of areas. So, all right. Okay, so Venus flytrap. Have any of you guys ever seen any of these in the wild? I'd, I'd be curious. Um, as far as um, the expanse that I have seen, it's, it's pretty limited to like Horry County area. Um, so, um, I think they were a lot more prevalent. Um, they actually exist. Um, the, their favorite area is called a Sandhill Seep system. And it's actually, it, they occur in like little small patches. They're kind of boggy. They have, there's a clay lens um, with an impermeable layer that forces groundwater up like as a seepage. Um, 
And I mean, if you think about it, people don't really like that in their backyards. Like they don't want a bog in their backyard. Um, so some of this habitat has, has um, been diminished. Um, they also, they're very, um, you know, linked to um, like burn areas. They, they can't have, you know, a substantial um, like, you know, ramble or anything around them. They need, they need like a cleaned out area. Um, I think I'm describing that correctly. Yeah, yeah. But, they, don't, they, they don't, they're they don't. they not going to thrive in a place with a bunch of shrubs and bushes mm -hmm. and trees around them. So they need that, yeah. they need that um, you know, that burn to come mm -hmm. through and kill back all those things so they can, yeah. they can thrive. Yeah, and it's it's actually very interesting too. Um, if you think about you know the applications of having a lot more um, like a lot more growth in an area um, that can de deplete um, the groundwater um, access for for these, and over time that area becomes less boggy, so it's less well suited for a species like this. Um, so pretty fascinating stuff. Um, I I have not seen a Venus flytrap out in in the uh, in the wild either, but um, now that I know where they are, I'm going to be on the hunt for sure. Okay, Devo Bang. Um, I think a lot of you guys have probably heard about this area, and honestly, I had not heard about it prior to um, my discussion. I'd seen like aerials of it, and I knew that it was a refuge um, for seabirds. But um, Devo Bang um, has gotten a lot of uh, a lot of news uh, recently. Um, and Jay, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So DNR just recently found out that half of the Atlantic flyway population of whimbrels, um, you know, which are in, in steep decline, um, you know, roost on DeVoe Bank uh, for about a month, maybe month and a half in the Mayish, you know, um, time frame of the year. Um, so, you know, there's around 20,000 of these whimbrels that uh, that will roost there, or at least they have, you know, recently, maybe, you know, maybe even even longer because um, they just kind of found that out. But it was a huge, huge deal. You know, uh, they had a huge event. A lot of prominent, you know, bird people were around. It was really fun to, to hear them get so excited about this, this bank, this DeVoe Bank, and uh, these whimbrels that, you know, are flying all the way up here from the northern part of South America. You know, they're coming here for about a month or so, you know, roosting here because there's no predators on this, on this uh, island formation. And then they're going out into the, in the estuaries and, and all you know, the, the land around it feeding, and then they come back and they can sleep well. They don't have any, again, predators to bother them or to eat them. Um, and then they continue on after they fatten up um, onto their, their breeding site. So really, really important formation that we have off of the coast. And, you know, I, I guess these things come and go. So how long will this one be here? Yeah. Um, nothing's, nothing's permanent, right? But mm -hmm. are we are we speeding up the the erosion? I, I don't I don't know what's what's really you know going to happen to this bank, but right now it's a very very important stop for uh, for these birds. Yeah, I mean this is pretty fascinating, and this is like a very great example of actual sediment transport in action um, along our coastline. So you can see, um, actually, it's pretty fascinating too. If you look at a Seabrook um, Island, like you can see like like how, you know, sand over the years has been deposited and depleted and um, all of that on some of these surrounding islands too, just the way, you know, the spits are formed and um, you can actually like check out and, um, and see how the, the longshore um, current actually has moved the sand, um, you know, down the beach and deposited it in certain areas. So uh, Devo is a really cool example of sediment transport because it's also, I mean, this isn't, you know, an inlet right here um, where there's a lot of sediment transport um, typically coming through that inlet. And as we discussed, we have, we have sediment transport, you know, all the way from like our mountains in Piedmont all the way down um, to this area. Now, some of, some of the uh, sediment that's deposited in this area is actually from like like biological deposition. Um, you know, we have lots of different species um, down here that, uh, that they create um, shells or tests. And so um, you might see, you know, an influx of, um, of like the calcium carbonate um, in some of these areas, uh, depending on like where you look, but we have sediment transport from, um, from the inlet here. And then we have sediment transport generally from north to south. Um, from like Seabrook Island and the beaches that are north of Seabrook. Um, 
this is where, you know, what we do comes into play. You can see this, um, this is 2021 right here. Um, in 2005, you can see we had quite a bit more sand out here. Now it's changed a lot. Um, it's very interesting, actually. If you look at this, there's a New York Times article um, that shows the actual change of the island over time. Um, I would encourage you to look at that or um, look at Google Earth and just scan through. Um, these Both of these images are just from Google Earth. And um, you can see how, how the transport has changed. There has been less availability of, of uh, sand um, in this area. And that may be attributed. I'm not, I like, you know, won't, you know, say this specifically, but like it, it may be attributed to engineering controls that we've we've placed um, further up the beach. Um, so, you know, we place engineering controls because we don't want to lose our sand on our beaches, but it can affect, um, you know, little little sand spits and barrier islands like this um, that we are we have as a refuge. So, just something to consider. Okay, so what can we do with this info? Um, real quick, real quick um, yeah. if, sorry, I was muted, I was trying to. Um, hey, uh, Miranda had um, included the link to the video about the birds at DeVoe. Oh, good, I, the Cornell video? Yeah, on the, uh, yeah, about the Wimbrels, the DNR. Yeah. Uh, ornithology. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. If you're a bird person, nature person, you know, have a box of Kleenex with you because it's it's sweet, it's, it's beautiful to see so many people smiling about nature yeah. and birds. And um, it, so the link's on here if you want to see it. Thank you, Miranda. But I'll also we'll we'll also put it on the email that we send with the link to the YouTube recording of this right now. Yes. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. mention. That. Yeah, it's. I mean, it is pretty remarkable to see like what the, some of the research they've done out there. Um, and I I'm being converted to a bird person. This is happening <laughs> like very quickly. <laughs> Jay has has been a part of that conversion. I've been a rock person, and now I'm a bird. I'm becoming a bird person. So um, I know a lot, a lot less about um, birds, but like, yeah, that even just reading that article was very moving. Um, just to see, like, how, I mean, how amazing um, some of our biodiver biodiversity is, and um, and what we've done to um, you know protect these environments. So anyway, um, that kind of leads into this what can we do with this information about geology? I just, you know, spouted off a bunch of geologic facts, but like, how can we actually apply this? Um, so you can support native wildlife to your region. Um, just think about it this way. What does the native landscape look like entirely unaltered? Um, if you look at uh, the USGS geologic maps, like what is the type of rock or soil that you would find in this area? Um, you know, how can we help, um, you know, create habitat for some of our native species? Um, you can look up on uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to see um, what kind of species are threatened or endangered in your area, or ask somebody on the Wildlife Federation team. They're an amazing resource. They know so much about um, different types of organisms that live all over the state, and as you can see, we've got a ton of different things. So, um, you know, I would just push, you know, promotion of ideal habitats, native habitats in your area, um, you know, in, com in combination, um, like with what you see there. So, for example, I live on like Paris Mountain or near Paris Mountain, and um, we have a lot of uh, partially weathered rock boulders around. And uh, last year during quarantine, I created a little rock garden that's like kind of near the road. Um, and like it kind of extends like over to like my little side yard and it's great habitat for some of our species here like little chipmunks love it um, i've been trying to grow like native flowers um, to to try to make it better for our pollinators but um reach out to the the wildlife federation team and see see what you can do yeah and there's and we have uh youtube videos in our in our little cache of, of videos that we've done since yeah. uh since we've been, you know, we started Zoom, but, um, you know, when you, when you think about those native plants, more and more nurseries, um, you know, are starting to carry these native plants. So again, mm -hmm. this book right here, A Guide to the Wildflowers of South Carolina, is fantastic to see what's in your area. I mean, it breaks it down, you mm -hmm. know, Hills, Piedmont, Coastal Plain, Maritime areas, you know, 
uh, Pocketsons, all, all that kind of stuff. And then the, the Blue Ridge. Um, so wherever you live in the state, you'll, you'll be able to find some plants that you might find at, at some nurseries. If you can't Google it um, or get in, in touch with us, we'll, we'll try to maybe connect you with somebody that could get their hands on them. But right. yeah, look at what's in your area. We've got a lot yeah. of sparkleberry, which is a blueberry here. I went out and bought sparkleberry because I know it grows here. And that's, uh, you know, um, supplementing these birds and, and yeah. all the whole wildlife that their diet with all these caterpillars because they um, support so many different um, kinds of caterpillars, species of caterpillars. Mm -hmm. Somebody mentioned Reed Douglas Ptolemy's book, which speaks to that even more. Yeah. You know, um, Brilliant Fella, Bringing Nature Home uh, is a great book. So Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope, it, it speaks to how important native plants are. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, Montgomery building a kind of a rock pile. That's fantastic. You know, brush piles are fantastic. Um, you know, you're you're providing habitat, but you're also providing food. Um, you know, for for um, wildlife, and they, they mm -hmm. kind of do both. So, keep on going. Sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, I mean, this is this is kind of just for questions and comments. I'm sorry that I've taken twenty more, twenty four more minutes of y'all's time than I initially anticipated. Um, you might be able to tell I could talk about geology all day long. So um, please, if you have any questions, please email me. Um, I would love to chat geology with you or talk about funny geology jokes. Um, <laughs> so uh, just please let me know um, what what I can do. And then just, I mean, we've discussed some of these resources where you can learn more about this. And this is like a loose citation. Most of this stuff um, was pulled from these different organizations and, um, and, and pages. But if you're interested in something specifically, I would encourage you to check this out, this list out. Um, there, there's some really cool stuff. There's also a really cute little short video called The Life Cycle of a Rock on YouTube. On YouTube and I would totally check that out too. Um, it it kind of goes through that whole interpretation of like a rock formation, um, you know, how it gets broken down, how, how we use them for different things. And, uh, and um, it, it's it's neat to see like you know another artistic interpretation um, of geology. So anyway, um, I really appreciate you guys coming so much. Um, I'll include that on the email going going out. Yeah, there. yeah, um, yeah. But I just encourage you guys, um, you know, take this knowledge and do something with it. I try. I've been trying to do that to you. Um, I'm not like typically a public speaker, and you know, this is something that I'm very passionate about. So. You don't have to be a public speaker. You can you can go and create a rock garden. You can um, you can do something. You can educate someone about of what you've learned. Or if you're curious, reach out to someone who does know um, a little bit more about about what you're curious about. So anyway, yeah. that's all I've got. Very curious. You said that from the get go. You were curious, and that's what it takes. We got yes. we have a whole planet to explore, y'all. Mm -hmm. Be curious and go find something that lights you up. It's uh it's awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you guys so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And y'all had some really good questions throughout. All right. And my email's on there. I just popped it on the chat. So if y'all have follow-up questions, uh, just email me um, and I'll, and I'll get in touch with uh, Montgomery if I can't answer those questions. So. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank y'all so much for joining us. If uh, if you want to support us, you know, just go to our website. Uh, these classes are free, and we do other classes at libraries and schools and churches, and and we don't charge for them. So we can't do that without y'all support. So please support us so we can spread the love of nature, y'all. Yes, please, please, please. Um, wildlife Federation, South Carolina Wildlife Federation, does some amazing work, um, as y'all can see, and they're such a knowledgeable group. So, um, you know please reach out to them if you've got questions or um, if you want, uh, you know, them to do something um, in, in your, at your business or your school, or, um, you know, th this is a, a really great resource that we have here. Contact me. Yes. Contact <laughs> you. <laughs> All right. Y'all be good. Awesome. Be safe this weekend. Um, be careful wherever you might find yourself and uh, hope you find some cool things outdoors. Thank you, Montgomery. Yeah. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Bye. All right. Take care.